welcome to Slash Forward. The 1986 film Uninvited is a strange and succulent ambrosia. It somehow brings together the concept of a sentient animal-based teratoma, bubbling wounds, crime and injury, pushy boat guests, sextants, biology of various types, and all kinds of other stuff. Is this cat-based horror or boat-based horror? How does this all fit together and does it do so in a coherent way? We'll take a look, but before we dig down deep, we're going to have to sift through the story that's simmering on the surface of this stew. Let's get to it. We open on a skyscraper thrusting aggressively into the air. The outer calm belies the events unfolding in the chaotic interior. Men in hazmat suits are busy chasing a kitty cat into the corner of a stairwell. The lead gunman manages a direct hit with a trank dart for easy transport. But their cat has another cat inside, and that one delights in spilling the blood of its enemies. We then meet a couple of ladies about town, who packed up and drove to Fort Lauderdale with no prior arrangements. With spring break well underway, they struggle to find a vacancy. They're shooed out of their final option when they have a chance encounter with Walter Graham, who vouches for them. Knowing how to jump on a good deal, he invites Suzanne and Bobby to come discuss their future living arrangements over a fine meal of caviar and oysters on the half shell, but they barely even get started when Walter's joined by his fellow big shots Mike and Albert, who have come to spirit their business partner away to an important meeting. He agrees to go, confident that he has done enough to secure their RSVP to his yacht party that evening. On the way out, Mike tries to refocus him on the important and unspecified business of deal making. They take their meeting in international waters, for legal purposes, and try to convince Daryl that the heat they're under will soon blow over. They just need him to keep his cool and hold steady until the SEC moves on so they can all make a little money. But he keeps acting squirrely and makes a point of emphasizing that he hasn't told the SEC anything. And he never would. Uh, not that they've asked, though. Now, they can't think about anything other than that thing he just said. And Walter has a strict policy of never letting anyone hold something over his head. That means the necessary dispensation of poor Daryl's soul. Despite the clean kill, Albert nearly paints his loafers with caviar as Walter leaves them to handle the body. Ignoring that this does, of course, give them blackmail power over him. In colder climates, we meet up with Corey and Lance. A couple of spring breaking bros share a pitcher and some za as they try to figure out an angle to hustle their way to Fort Lauderdale. Destined to fail in life, these two losers tip Martin with a scratcher that was worth $100. Suckers. Back in Fort Lauderdale, we see a familiar orange tabby searching for scraps near the docks. Nearby, the boys are here now, hoping to scope out some classy chicks at the marina. Of course, with Lance's hickey on full display, they just gotta sit back and wait for the ladies to come to them. They're interrupted by Martin, who's sad to report back that they're there are no rooms available in town, but the ladies waste no time bragging about their new sugar daddy, Walter Graham, a man Corey recognizes as Wall Street Walter, a certified baller. The ladies figure he'd love to have some more swing and dick on his cruise, so they invite the fellas to come along with the added intention of hoping these total strangers can protect them if their benefactor tries to get fresh. Who knows, this could be the adventure of a lifetime. You're damn right. When Walter and his compatriot roll up to the marina, we learn the girls are just there as cover for their international crews of illegal business dealings. As the gang of unwitting accomplices to an unknown crime roll up, they run across the feral tabby. And given the likely mistreatment implied by its genetic lab ID collar, Suzanne determines to deprive her owner of their property. Of course, they can barely look at the boat before Lance nearly ejects his lunch, but they've come too far. So they're soon scuttling out in real time to the yacht. On the bridge, we learn that Walter ran off the whole crew with his bad behavior, but this is a family boat that Rachel's hoping to earn back through superior captaining. Out on the poop deck, the boys are getting ejected on account of they don't have vaginas, and even Corey's preternatural ability to kiss ass doesn't secure their passage. But then the shuttle arrives with Albert, who brings warnings of the heat being on, requiring them to get out to open seas. With no crew but the gift of these able-bodied buccaneers, Walter relents and promotes them all to junior boatmen. That, and then the fact that cats on boats represent good luck pretty much accounts for all of them. Below deck, they find the remnants of the prior night's rager. Over the top of this funk, they get the groove started again, a necessary first step for any ship hand. Hey, they're just getting loose for the grueling work ahead, which Mr. Graham reminds them of. Mike then starts delegating matters that need attention, but the boys aren't used to taking orders. Bobby cools the room a bit with her sweet talking, demonstrating to the young bulls that if they just humor their hosts a little, they can keep things 
gliding along smoothly. As they get started, the partners confirm that the cash is tucked away safely in the safe and that the plan is to go to South America via the Cayman Islands. Everyone settles in and Rachel attempts to make a semen out of Albert. And in the utility room, the kitty's kitty rips up some cords and cables. Rachel lets Walter know that they're headed into a storm, so he gives her a firm hug and appreciation of her navigational skills. Meanwhile, the boys are making the best of their situation, but are devastated by the volume of food waste they have to reckon with. The girls come in to give them a little something for their trouble, but just a taste for now. That night, Albert's left to man the rudder all alone, so he finds the classic seaman's companion and settles in for a long night. Downstairs, Walter starts the party off with some expert ball play. The mature ones tuck themselves to the side for an intellectual game of backgammon, but do admire the other's ability to find pleasure in simple pastimes. Look at those guys. They really know how to have fun, don't they? Rope play? You know it! A very drunk Walter casually insults Martin and Rachel, prompting her to go take control of the wheel. While at the party, the tunage gets cranked to the max. As they dry hump all over the floor, the cat slips away in the confusion of their bodily movements. Rachel finds Albert three sheets to the wind and way off course, so she relieves him. He goes to find some more wine and is terrified by the sudden appearance of the cat. He gets his drink and spits it at the poor feline, resulting in a gnarly revelation. He breaks the bottle for protection, but is too slow to stab. As a result, Albert suffers a pulsing wound and screams into the void before going over board. Amid the din and fog of hedonism, Mike hears the familiar sound of a man screaming. He goes to check it out and returns to ruin Walter's good time. They determine that Albert must have gone over. Afraid the cabinet would want to circle back to try to save him, they agree to keep this as their little secret. The next morning, the ladies get to sunbathing while Walter leers at them. Rachel notifies him that the boat is running hot, so she has to shut her down. With no navigation to do, Rachel discovers evidence of Albert's fate. The men play like this is all news to them, but things do not go according to plan when Rachel informs them that she has to notify the authorities and circle back. As a moral deterrent, Walter plays his ace card and informs her that he's prepared to sign the boat over to her if she can get them to the Caymans on time. Once that's all settled, he gets in some more good leering. She decides to at least fill out the log. As she's doing so, Martin busts in asking to borrow her sextant. Rude. And with that and a magnifying glass, he examines a scrap of Albert's clothes. He's a very curious boy, so he takes takes a peek and finds an overabundance of red blood cells, even for fresh blood, which this is not. Meanwhile, as Bobby gets in her calisthenics, Walter tries to entice her to stick around after he finishes his deal and be his girl. She's not enthusiastic about this, and he's had about enough of them humoring him, causing him to lay down an ultimatum. Lance leaps to her rescue, but things tend to get shooty when Mike's around. Walt claims he was jumped, which Mike don't like, but then Corey joins the fray as well. Unfortunately, Unfortunately, this grizzled old gangster is no pushover. However, the cat does strip his ankle to the bone, making him very angry. When he fails to hit the cat, he starts taking pot shots in the hope of bringing one of them with him. When things are more settled and they're administering first aid, Martin notices that Mike's heart is beating like a jackhammer. And also, apparently, no one saw the cat, so his ankle injury is baffling. This is obviously too much, so Rachel goes to call in a mayday. But Walter has a different idea about how to handle the situation. It involves shooting the radio to show he means business so he can threaten Rachel if she doesn't get the boat moving again, even if it risks overheating the engine. Convinced it requires a man's touch, Walter lays in on it, giving Rachel the chance to turn the tables with a suffocating dose of CO2. Once secured, Suzanne keeps him in check under the threat of losing his nards. Back in the party room, Martin is putting his biology undergrad to work, suggesting the poisoned cat is causing mutated blood through biting. Bobby confirmed that she saw the cat leaving the room, but that it looked kind of gross and weird. They immediately think back to the lab ID and start to put the pieces together while Mike sits over here throbbing and sweating like a beast as his blood goes out of control, causing him to expire. They respectfully wrap him in virginal white and perform a burial at sea. Then they lock Walter in a room so they can think for a few minutes without him trying to hump somebody. Over a period of time, Bobby and Lance get themselves positively spooked over a noise they hear that ends up being nothing. Elsewhere, Rachel shares her life story while fixing the electric 
theatrical, revealing that this boat used to belong to her father. Back in the jail room, Walter gives Corey an extra Rolex he had lying around, but this doesn't buy his trust, so he goes to his wall safe to show off his cash collection. He offers a bundle if Corey helps him get to the Cayman Islands. In the engine room, Martin finds some croutons, somehow causing him to suggest that anything the cat eats becomes contaminated, same as how he bites people. As Suzanne readies herself for bed, yeah. she gets totally faked out by Corey. They work out an arrangement of protection, which is sealed mostly through mouth play and nothing else. After two days, Rachel tries to get her started again, and despite their best wishes, nothing happens. So they're still stuck on this luxury yacht with a crazy cat. To take their mind off it, Bobby tries to help Lance regain the feeling in his arm with a hot makeout session, complete with some grody 80-yard mouth noises. Bobby goes to check his dead arm and they find the cat going to town on it. He immediately runs out thinking it's already over for him, even though his arm is working now. He goes over and takes Bobby with him, prompting the boys to dive in after, but the pair never surfaces again. They contemplate the implications of this as they warm by the fire, and despite a desire to remain optimistic about things, Suzanne knows better. With limited time now, they have no choice but to let Walter out so he can be part of the kitty search party while Rachel works on the boat. Suzanne refuses to help, despite Corey's thrusting and promise of a kiss, but Martin brings her around again with the gentle touch of a born leader. So they all go about their businesses, setting out some poisoned mounds of meat, tending to the ship, and trying to get by on some fairly severe rationing. Later on, when Corey goes to check his traps, he suspects the cat may be privy to the poison, and with a prime opportunity presented, the little beast jumps out at him, causing him to shoot wildly into the darkness. He ends up busting a pipe and splitting his face wide open with some steam. The creature then awkwardly climbs back into its cat suit. They lose another bed linen, and then Walter makes like he's going for the life raft, but he ain't got the balls. Then they find the cat's gotten into the remainder of the food, contaminating everything. This leads some of them to finger point, but not Suzanne. She has reached her acceptance phase. Despite this, she greedily goes searching for some extra rations, telling Martin to hell with his expertise, but he locks her out. <laughs> no fear. Rachel finds them loafing about, having accepted their fates. You're being a dumb bitch. The little flare-up of old feelings results in them storming off and leaving the keys behind. Suzanne immediately snags them and heads straight to the pantry. After successfully choking down a crust of bread without dying, she's convinced that there was absolutely nothing to Martin's little theory. This forces her to surmise that her fate is a result of undiagnosed celiac that must be aggravating a latent goiter, causing it to throb beyond capacity and bleed her out all over the floor. In this case, the cat is merely her audience. They get hit that night by the huge storm, and somebody left a porthole open. Their only real option now is to take the life raft. But Walter couldn't live as only two-thirds of a triple millionaire, so he goes back for his final briefcase. But it has been claimed by the kitty, who refuses to be deprived of her personal property. Martin tells Rachel to lower into the water so he can get Walter and then swim out to the dinghy. But he quickly discovers that Walter is no longer their concern, so he dives in and boards the life raft as the yacht sinks below the surface. Man, can you even imagine the production costs of this film? They learn that they're now millionaires, securing their financial future. Just just so long as they're not boarded by a teratoma. Round one passes with no injury, but round two comes very quickly. They empty one of the cases to give the creature an alternate life raft, and the trick works. They manage to find shore in the Cayman Islands and secure passage back home. But out at the docks, a young boy shows his daddy the fruits of his scavenging trip. Hoping they've scored some important business documents, they quickly open it to find... <coughs> I'm not sure what more needs to be said or explained about the plot of this movie. It was a pretty straightforward narrative. Walter was a well-known business trader who was also involved in some nefarious trading on the side. He had a few million in cash that he wanted to get to the Cayman Islands, at which point he was to finalize some sort of business deal that would make them all a large quantity of additional money. From there, they intended to hide out in South America somewhere. He acquired his yacht from Rachel's dad when he was in a poor financial position. I believe this was a rental yacht or a touring yacht of some type. Rachel wanted to keep the family business going, so she stuck around no matter what, in the hope that she would eventually be able to buy the boat back. Outside of that, you basically get what you see. You want additional reasoning why Suzanne and Bobby invited some strangers to join them on a cruise with some other strangers? Well, you're not entitled to anything, and therefore shall receive nothing. They 
they just did it. No explanation of the cat was ever provided and there was no intimation of what was happening to it outside of Martin's assessment that it was poison. Realistically, at the end of the day, the cat was only half the trouble here because the various boat guests mixed like oil and water. So what was going on with the cat? What was its motivation? What did it desire? It seemed to be attacking people, but not for food and inconsistently. There was no real pattern to what was going on there. It was obviously messed up, so maybe no further explanation is required. It clearly could survive on normal people food, so it did not hunger for human flesh as a means of sustenance. Does the creature that made itself known to them count as an actual teratoma? Teratomas exist in real life. It's a rare type of cancer-like cell growth that actually contains all different types of cell tissue that mimic the biology of its host. I saw a documentary once where they had removed a 3 to 5 pound teratoma and were examining it. It was like a human being if a human being was a little ball. It was comprised of fleshy tissue with hair coming off it in various places, small sporadic presence of teeth, finger-like protuberances that branched off in a hand-like fashion with little fingernails on the end. It was really wild, and there's a subset of horror movies that revolve around this concept taken to a conflict-inducing extreme, usually in that the teratoma isn't just a benign or malignant growth, but that it actually gains some degree of sentience or control over the host body. In this case, it was a twisted version of the cat that hosted it, but what throws me is that it actually left the host body completely, and then went back into it afterward. I'm not sure if that actually counts or if that takes things too far. The lab doing research on the cat was a genetic lab, so it makes sense that this was some sub-feline form generated by the cat's own biology. But there's the addition of overactive blood that it spreads like a virus through bite that violently kills its victims. Of course, to some degree, you just have to have consequences for the characters coming in contact with the monster. And the movie doesn't necessarily have to be a detailed and nuanced examination of the phenomenon, so much as just a cool and interesting idea that would look nice on screen, which it did. They had some good moments that really strive to build character and insert little beats to add some realism to the interactions. When Suzanne was losing it, she struggled with feeling responsible for introducing the cat to their crews. But Martin had said cats are good luck, so she tried to pass the blame off on him in order to assuage her own guilt. He accepted this to help smooth things over and try to keep her calm and rational for the good of the group. That's a nice little something to add in there, give the story some layers, and build some character. Did they overall pull this off? Obviously not, but they did try, and that's the primary strength of the story here. The actors really tried to fill out their characters. I assume that a lot of that can be attributed to the actors because many parts of this felt ad-libbed. You know, you may question why Walter would let some random dudes on his boat, but he actually spent a lot of time insisting they leave. He was even about to eject the ladies as well when they tried to lay down an ultimatum. It was only the mounting outside pressures that caused him to give in. He also put up a lot of resistance to allowing the cat on board. And so they were trying and put in a good effort to make it unfold in a logical and reasonable way. This movie is great for fans of 80s horror and practical effects. It teeters precariously on that edge of low-budget films where they're forced to fill the space between interesting things with really boring, drawn-out scenes of dialogue and exposition because they don't have the budget to do anything else. There's definitely less cat in here than I would have preferred, but they had a pretty solid B story that provided its own tension and conflict, which was smart. That's not to say that it was tight and lean with no unnecessary scenes, but usually these scenes were interesting or humorous in their incoherence. Also, people who find joy in discovering the obscure classics of the era will want to check this out. It has many redeeming qualities that don't necessarily make it good in a traditional sense, but that do make it very entertaining and enjoyable to watch for a variety of other reasons. Now that we're here, I want to congratulate you for making it to the end of the video and affirm that you are a very special person because of it. And before we go, I'd like to give a huge thanks to my donors, memorialized in the Hall of Headshots. I have a website set up where you can support the channel through donations or merch. Any donation unlocks a growing collection of uncensored movie recaps. And if you enjoyed the video, I would love for you to become part of the channel by subscribing. Thanks for watching.